October 1997, the Department of Defense was alerted by the City of Chicago Sewer Service about suspected trafficking-related activity in some tunnels for the past three years. It was believed that an international network funded from Colombia, with strong monitoring from a prison in Chihuahua, Mexico, might be operating there. Additionally, residual levels had started to show unusually high numbers, indicating a possible blockage in Zone 71 of the underground system, where materials were previously processed following the sanitary guidelines of the 1960s. After the alert, the Department of Defense formed an extraordinary committee, given the conditions that had been under study since a report from the Wyoming State Police warned of a possible plague with characteristics unknown to science. This became evident with a study of biological material found in a cabin, which showed an excessively high concentration of a substance capable of branching out into the organs of various living organisms, including humans. The committee decided to send a specialized military team to investigate the deepest sewers in Chicago, as the main danger at that time was the potential spread of a disease that could infect some rivers. In March 1997, the Four Seasons, the Peninsula, the Drake and the Waldorf Astoria Hotels, all located in the city of Chicago, had to temporarily close their swimming pool facilities for three weeks due to a severe malfunction in the cleaning and drainage systems. This drew significant attention due to the simultaneous occurrence of these events and the similarity in the substances found floating in the pools. The substance was described as viscous and yellow in color, accompanied by spherical structures ranging in size from a golf ball to that of a human head. These were removed, with most of them being disposed of in garbage containers, while others were returned to the sewer system. Due to information restrictions imposed by the luxurious hotels, only security camera footage from the pool areas could be obtained.
three teenagers went out to explore the old sewers of Lake Michigan. With a camera in hand, they ventured into one of the largest pipes and, after traveling about 300 meters, they encountered a huge, insect-like creature that was petrified. Even the young people touched it, and it did nothing. They said it was humanly terrifying because it had the deformed face of a middle-aged man. The photograph was confiscated after they were arrested by the police. The military team began searching the wells of the fourth underground floor of the old zone, carrying cameras, weapons, and explosives in order to record the possible presence of entities that posed a risk of water contamination. They found about 15 well entrances of various sizes leading to sites more than 20 meters underground. The old wells had been designed according to the 1960s schematics to isolate certain substances that could emit toxic gases. However, throughout history, nothing more than mold and small bacteria had accumulated, posing no risk to the surface. In the wells that reached a depth of 30 meters, they found remains of unexplainable material whose movement resembled that of strange larvae and pulsating organic tissues organized in extensive networks of mucus. Some impossible-sized eggs, which couldn't be attributed to birds or worms, began to appear in the deeper wells. The military team decided to send an extensive probe with cameras to venture into the underground pipes, which, due to the labyrinthine nature of the subterranean area and the lack of updated blueprints, posed an imminent risk due to the unknown substances and gases in the area. The image results provided irrefutable evidence of what the Emergency Committee of the Department of Defense had suspected. Strange insectoid creatures were scattered across large segments of Chicago's oldest sewer system. They were forming true nests of creatures that had never seen the light of day, feeding on waste, moisture, and in ways that have not been possible to determine. The following records revealed the presence of hyperdeveloped creatures inhabiting the tunnels. Contact with these creatures was mostly through probes with cameras, although on some occasions. The military team came face to face with the mutant insects. They were mostly described as moths with an excessive level of development, possibly altered by some substance that radically modified their phenotypic structure. They could have been the result of an unreported nuclear disaster to the relevant authorities. However, agents were investigating rare sightings in the skies off the western coast of the American continent, where some people reported witnessing inexplicable creatures flying over farms during plague seasons. The testimonies always pointed to insects larger than normal, which seemed to lead others, including some tractor caravans.
During the detonation process in the tunnels of Zone, one of the few security cameras stationed at one of the exits of the fifth underground floor captured the following image before everything exploded. And the recording was lost. It was a shadowy figure that was walking very slowly through the wastewater in the opposite direction of the explosions. Its appearance, similar to that of a human, raised the question of whether a member of the military team had become trapped in one of these passageways. A subsequent review of all team members revealed that everyone had returned alive, and no one had even passed through that area at any point during the expedition. Último minuto. Ricardo Castellón y Portonero, médico cirujano de 42 años, quien ha estado en el ojo del huracán desde agosto, ha sido finalmente detenido por la policía de Andalucía hoy 19 de septiembre. Los cargos que pesan sobre este médico son de suma gravedad. Se le imputa negligencia médica, faltas graves gravísimas al código sanitario, posesión de arsenal de guerra y la participación directa en ocho procedimientos quirúrgicos indebidos. Las primeras acusaciones sacudieron a la comunidad médica dejando a todos perplejos y preocupados por la seguridad de los pacientes en manos de profesionales de la salud. El arresto de Castellón y Portonero ha generado un intenso debate acerca de la práctica en clínicas particulares. The following story takes us back to the late 1990s in the region of Andalusia, Spain. In the city of Seville, a small clinic operated within an office building in the heart of the city. Like any other independent medical center, it specialized in aesthetic procedures. But here's the peculiar twist to this horrifying case. They also performed procedures aimed at curing terminal illnesses, congenital deformities, and even treating blindness, hypertension, and musculoskeletal injuries. Ricardo Castellan y Porto Nero was an average doctor, unknown to the Spanish healthcare community, who had been the director and chief surgeon of his own clinic since 1997. His work did not differ from traditional practices in such centers. However, he was performing procedures that would seem impossible outside a hospital operating room and with such a small team of specialists. The first complaints arose the following year, stemming from a botched Botox procedure on one of his clients. 
This incident marked the beginning of subsequent investigations that gradually unveiled the highly unusual practices of this man. Yo no sé lo que me hizo ese hombre. A mí el doctor de toda la vida me dijo que tenía un tumor en la cabeza. Algo imposible de operar y de tratar. Las esperanzas eran mínimas. Así que mi Paquita, mi sobrina, me llevó a este doctor que atendía en el centro de Sevilla. Él me prometió curarme. Yo al comienzo no le creí nada, pero era eso o simplemente despedirme de la vida. A las semanas después de la operación, el doctor Ricardo me dijo que estaba en perfecto estado, que el tumor se había ido. Incluso me mostró unas radiografías. Ahí sí que le creí. El problema fue que, seis meses después, comencé a perder la sensibilidad en mis pies. Luego las piernas, hasta que no pude caminar más. Al año no podía mover mi cuerpo desde el cuello hacia abajo. Cuando decidí volver a los doctores del hospital, Estaban tremendamente sorprendidos porque el tumor efectivamente había desaparecido, pero encontraron algo inexplicable en mi cuello, junto a mi médula espinal. Era un parásito, no recuerdo el nombre, es algo complicado. Me dijeron que eso se estaba alimentando de mi médula y mi columna por su cuerpo. Y esa cosa era la que había eliminado mi tumor, comiéndoselo y creciendo gracias a eso. Intentaron preparar una cirugía de emergencia cuando se enteraron, pero era demasiado arriesgado. En este momento estamos esperando a un médico alemán que puede abordar este caso en un par de meses más. On September 19, 2003, along with the arrest of Castian E. Portonero, the police raided his private clinic in Seville. A couple of nurses and a secretary were also arrested on allegations of complicity in the doctor's crimes. Inside, all documents, patient records, as well as the legal clinic registration records, financial documents, and surgical implements were confiscated. The forensic team searched the office and discovered a series of extremely bizarre things they would have never expected to find in a private clinic. What initially started as an investigation into malpractice turned into the examination of a case incomprehensible to science. In a couple of storage rooms, several transparent containers were found, filled with a dark yellowish liquid, some containing strange rigid figures inside. Both on tables and on the floor, there were limbs from an unidentified animal, possibly an invertebrate. These were extremely large and elongated for a normal creature. Moreover, they appeared to have been removed no more than a couple of days ago, so they had not undergone a significant decomposition process. In other rooms used as operating theaters, there were larger containers that held enormous larvae of some mutant moth species. Inside, you could still observe certain reflex movements upon exposure to light and noise. These containers weighed between 20 to 30 kilograms. When they were removed from the building, strange shrieks were emitted by these larvae. Estuve muy mal durante unas dos o tres semanas. Mi estómago me dolía mucho. Aunque siempre he tenido problemas digestivos, desde pequeña. Una amiga me recomendó a este tipo, porque le había realizado un procedimiento estético muy bueno y como él es médico, podría ayudarme a un buen precio. Al examinarme y hacerme algunas pruebas, fue tajante en decirme que tenía una severa disfunción a nivel del intestino delgado. La mucosa interna estaba siendo poco efectiva para eliminar ciertos componentes de mi alimentación, así que me recomendó una intervención altamente invasiva con el fin de implantarme unos gusanos, de las que aseguraba regenerarían parte de mis intestinos. Ahí comenzó mi infierno. Al primer mes iba todo perfecto, pero noté que no estaba ganando peso a pesar de comer más de lo habitual. El doctor Ricardo me había dicho que eso era normal, que no me preocupara. Ya el segundo mes comencé a desmayarme en todos lados, y a vomitar mucho, estaba, casi anémica. Sentí un bulto entre el abdomen y el cuello muy ligero, que con los días empezó a crecer, hasta que ya no resistí más. Me dieron horribles punzadas en el pecho y mi condición de salud era horrible. 
Me llevaron de urgencia al hospital, donde me realizaron un escaneo con rayos X y encontraron esta asquerosidad dentro de mí. Tuvieron que realizarme una cirugía de urgencia. Me encontraron una enorme larva de casi 15 centímetros de largo rodeando mi corazón y fusionándose con parte de mi pulmón derecho. Tardé un año en lograr la primera etapa de mi rehabilitación. Ese médico está loco.
One of those afternoons when a bone-chilling wind cuts right through you. It seemed like winter would arrive sooner than expected, and that wasn't good news for me. The bell on the entrance of the Minna Market no longer chimed as it used to whenever someone walked in. I had grown so accustomed to that little sound that it took me a while to realize it was gone. Maybe they removed it from its place days ago for some reason. Who knows? Inside it was so warm. I can't recall ever seeing Ryan, the guy at the cash register, wearing a sweater or anything over his t-shirt. Winter or summer, it was always the same in here, except for the product prices. This crap was a problem for everyone, every year. Damn, this damn milk went up by two bucks. Came from the back aisle. The voice sounded familiar. It was Don Wasser, that stingy old man who complained even about the deals when they weren't good enough. He must have been banned from other places, otherwise I couldn't explain why I'd been seeing him here so often. But he was right. The milk was indeed pricier than last week. The store owner was a rat. It wasn't the first time he did this without a reasonable cause, and, as usual, poor Ryan had to swallow the complaints and grievances. The poor kid seemed so scared every time someone approached him with a frown, complaining about something. Don Wasser could be really cruel at times, and this wouldn't be an exception. That damn Chinaman can go to hell with his sails, he told the young guy, pointing his finger at him. Next time I come for groceries, you better have him here. Got it? Ryan nodded fearfully with each scolding, while he nervously wiped his sweaty hand through his hair from his forehead back behind his ear, leaving a sticky trail of sweat on his bony face. Meanwhile, I didn't want to spend so much money on milk, but I couldn't decide which one to get. My little Alice would probably kill me if her pancakes didn't have the exact taste she liked. How could a six-year-old have such a picky palate? Well, kids can be like that sometimes, more perceptive than us. I settled for the $2.50 McGowan milk. A rip-off, no matter how you looked at it. But there were even more ridiculously expensive ones. I also picked up a few tomatoes, bologna packets, and four beer cans. Those I took from the back of the fridge, where no one ever touched them. In the checkout line, there were two other people trying to joke with Ryan about Don Wasser, but the young man seemed even more nervous than when the man was yelling. It must be very exhausting for him, so shy and forced by his dad to work in such a public-facing role. What cruelty! But the boy had to learn to grow into a decent and confident man. That's what I was taught. That'll be $13.50, sir, Ryan said after ringing up my purchases. Are you okay, kid? I don't know if I actually cared about how he was doing, but I had to stall as I searched for some coins in my pockets. Sure, Mr. Donovan, you know how people get on bad days. Shit, yes they do. I took the 50 cents and placed them on the conveyor belt. You gotta stand up to him sometime. No one's gonna kick you out of here for putting that idiot in his place. They've told me, but... Don Wasser's an idiot, you gotta know that. The cleaning lady and the Chinaman, your boss, they know it. And they couldn't care less about how to treat customers. The kid cracked a smile and his face started turning as red as the Beaufort cigarette pack I grabbed from the display shelf next to the cash register. I'm short on cash, kid. I'll pay you back tomorrow. Sir, two weeks ago you took a bag of chips you haven't paid for yet. That's it. That's what I like to hear. That's how you need to stand up to Don. And, uh, oom. Um, add the cigarettes to my tab. I left the store with a smile that later made me feel somewhat guilty. Sometimes, I can also be hard on that kid. And maybe he dislikes me as much as he does the jerks who make his life miserable both in and out of work. Next time I'll give him a gift and, of course, pay what I owe to the store.
On Saturday, I ran into Mrs. Cindy Rendallo in the canned goods section of the store. She was wearing her usual yellow feathered hat and a tightly fitted jacket of the same color, cinched at the waist. I don't know what she was aiming for, dressing like a teenager if she couldn't even leave those extravagant 18th century hats at home. Perhaps no one had told her yet how ridiculous she looked, not even the pair of neighbors on her floor, who, as uninterested in the world as they were, I doubt could overlook such a spectacle. Excuse me, Mr. Donovan, would you be so kind as to reach me those cans of strawberries? Canned strawberries? For a moment, I thought I had said that out loud. Here you go. Thank you so much. Have you ever thought about buying them fresh? I mean, with all the preservatives and plastic and processed food. Oh, goodness, she sighed. The sugar. It's the sugar, Mr. Donovan. Addictions are not very accommodating to our poor taste buds. Do you still smoke? I nodded silently. Then you'll understand. Ask yourself. She was right, and it was unfair. Cigarettes were giving me constant coughing fits and hellish phlegm. Meanwhile, sugar didn't touch even an inch of her clothing size. And there I was once again, in front of the cigarette display by the cash register, rummaging through the disgusting chocolate-scented Kenworthy's in case there were any of the Beaufort Tens left. Ryan, where are my cigarettes? I asked. Sir, we've had a delay with this weekend's shipment. You know, the strikes in Denver. Don't you have any others that aren't these damn chocolate ones? There should be some. The young man took a deep breath and tried to finish the sentence. In the... dot stockroom. Please wait. At that moment, I noticed Ryan's face was paler than usual. I could swear he hadn't showered for over a day, and he hadn't even looked in the mirror this morning. No, you wait a moment. You look really bad. I grabbed the Kenworthy trash and put it on the conveyor belt. You should take the day off and see a doctor. It's allergies, I think. The change of seasons does this to me every year. He didn't sound very convincing. I owed you something, remember? I couldn't take my eyes off him. A long bead of sweat traveled from his temple to his chin, and he didn't seem to notice. It's five dollars, and this would be another five. Thank you. Let me mark it off the list. He wasn't even looking at the notebook. His eyes were glued toward the soda machine behind me. Without hesitation, I took my cell phone out of my pocket and dialed emergency services. Ryan, you look really bad. I'm calling an ambulance. Suddenly, I felt his hand, the warmth of his palm gripping my arm. Don't do it. It's allergies, like I said. Please, don't insist. His voice wasn't its usual self. It sounded more like a hoarse, raspy whisper, even monotone. When I turned to look at his face again, I noticed he had chapped lips, and he couldn't stop licking them persistently. All right, I won't call anyone. I walked toward the exit with my heart in my hands. That kid had given me a scare that cut deep into my core and remained there, chilling my body from the inside, the strength in his hands beastly, he was just a scrawny twenty-something, wasting his youth in a job more dehumanizing than anything. Everyone commented on that, about him and his boss. A jerk. The next day, before heading to the store for some sodas, I told my wife, Clarice, about the stupid dream I had the night before. It was that idiot Don Wasser. But picture him turned into a little fly. I don't know why that made me laugh so much when I started telling her. He came all the way over here to the dining room and started singing that song you like so much. What's it called again? Fly it to me. 
Yes, that's the one. That was a catchy song. I can't deny that. Although she took it more seriously than I did. Maybe that's why in my dreams, a fly as fat and ugly as Don Wasser was singing it. This time, the bell rang again when I opened the store door. I noticed it right away, just like Ryan noticed my presence. Mr. Donovan, good morning. The kid looked like new. Some color had returned to his face, and he didn't have that lost look he had the day before. Hey, kid, you look better. What happened to you yesterday? I told you it was allergies. Anaphylaxis. Did he say anaphylaxis? He was close to dying, and I didn't call the damn ambulance. Excuse me, what did you say? Anaphylaxis, an allergic reaction. You know, your skin turns all red and you can't breathe properly. Yesterday, you told me you didn't need to go to the hospital. I was so baffled by his response that I didn't realize I was still holding the entrance door, blocking a man who wanted to come in. Yes, I'm sorry. I was really sick. I don't remember much about what happened yesterday. I noticed a lump under his t-shirt around his shoulder, close to his armpit. I approached to ask a few more questions. The doorbell tinkled again. What about your arm? I already told you, sir. He smiled at me. He smiled as if nothing had happened. It's the allergy. I had some treatments done because my skin had started to... Well, I'm not sure you'd want to hear those graphic details. I understand. Spare me the graphic descriptions. Ryan was so calm and in such a good mood. I had never seen him this cheerful. Not even once. I walked over to the cigarette shelf to look for my Beauforts, trying not to dwell on the fact that the kid could have died because of me. It didn't matter anymore. He was okay. And maybe due to the allergic crisis, he lost his mind and didn't hold me responsible for anything. And unfortunately for me, I didn't find my Beauforts among the rest of the packs. I turned my gaze back to Ryan to ask him about the stock again. But then I noticed something that grabbed my attention again. There. You've got something there. I pointed at the lower edge of my right eye with my pinky. I know some blood vessels in my eye burst from increased pressure. He kept that indifferent smile on his face. But I can still see it, sir. I didn't want to ask any more questions. Because truthfully, I didn't want to see that inked eye of his again. Blood has always given me the creeps. Three days later, I had to go to another store to get my Beauforts. My dear, lifelong neighbor's shop was closed, and the bell wouldn't ring again for at least four or five more days. Closed for mourning. The Lee family mourns the tragic passing of their wife. That's what the small note on the door said. A horrific moment for the owner. I thought about my daughter, about Claris. I pulled a cigarette out of my pocket and returned home, thinking about them and how much I loved them. Mr. Donovan, open up. It was a Thursday night, and a woman wouldn't stop knocking on the door. Mr. Donovan, open up. One moment, please. I heard you. My daughter is sleeping. There's no need for all this commotion. The woman didn't stop until I reached the entrance, and I saw her with trembling arms, breathing heavily. She was wearing a somewhat worn-out purple robe from times gone by, and was barefoot. Mrs. Clark, what's wrong? That kid... The police are surrounding the store, and you have to come down and see. He's going to kill them. It was hard to make out what she was saying. She was taking bigger and bigger gasps with each word. 
try to calm down and explain the situation to me again. But Mrs. Clark was a bit older, and in moments like these, there was no way she'd have any self-control. If you don't see it with your own eyes, you'll never believe me, she continued, even more distressed than before. All right, all right, just give me a second. I turned around to the coat rack near the door and grabbed a golf club I used to hide along with a few umbrellas for emergencies. That moment, I didn't know what to think. Mrs. Clark had never caused such a scene in the neighborhood. She had always been, as everyone called her, a really sweet old lady, so loving, quiet, and attentive to her chubby grandchildren. Clarice said something to me before I left, but honestly, I don't remember a single word. I just followed Mrs. Clark down the street with the golf club in my hands, gripping it tightly. If I had to beat up a thief, I wouldn't hesitate. The emergency flashing lights of police cars had filled the next block with red and blue hues and a few officers were guarding the area behind the police tape surrounding Mr. Lee's store. A few neighbors had gathered behind the tape, peeking at the massive security display. Before I could ask any questions, two more police officers passed by me, running towards the store entrance with their service weapons ready to fire at any moment. People startled as the authorities called for everyone to leave the area through a megaphone on one of the cars. The blare of sirens grew louder as more rescue vehicles, ambulances, and even two fire companies arrived. Back! Back! Denver police! Hands up! A loud crash echoed from the store entrance. The glass from the door shattered onto the asphalt, and one of the officers warned again. Hands up! Don't take another step! Do you understand? The atmosphere turned tense all of a sudden. Suddenly, everyone who had been observing the strange scene moved several meters away from the scene. Many hurried back to their homes, terror outweighing curiosity. Damn, it's that idiot Don Wasser, I muttered to myself, still gripping the golf club tightly. Don't make any other move. Otherwise, will be forced to restrain you by force, the police officer continued. Describing what happened next is difficult for me because, honestly, I don't know if what I saw was real. No one would believe it, even in my position. Yes, it was Don Wasser, I was sure of it. But not about what he was doing there, half naked, facing about seven police officers, pointing guns and shotguns at him. The man was only wearing a partially buttoned white shirt, with his arms and face covered in blood, with broken glass fragments still embedded in his greasy, chubby face. A yellowish drool oozed profusely from his mouth, dripping from his chin to his chest. His belly and all the obscene flesh jiggled with every step he attempted to take. He was out of his mind, with bloodshot, bulging eyes. Behind him, inside the store, I could make out the body of an emaciated young man seated in front of the cash register. Rigid, with his right eye socket shattered and hollowed out from his nose to his forehead. I warn you, one more step and we'll be forced. And it happened. Whatever was about to happen, happened just as I had seen it. Don Wasser's head exploded so suddenly that even the officer with the megaphone let out a horrified groan that everyone heard over the speaker. The man collapsed rigidly to the ground, drenched in a bloody pulp that spread into a pool of dark pus. And before anyone could even make a move to approach, brown wings, as large as his own body, sprouted out suddenly and lifted the once done wasser's mass of fat into the air. While in the countries of the Northern Hemisphere, New Year celebrations unfold in long nights, streets adorned with tender decorations and recurring snowstorms. In some areas of Latin America situated in the Southern Hemisphere, this happens in a completely different way. 
not only because socioeconomic conditions do not allow them to enjoy those festivities in the same manner, but for a rather unique climatic reason. Due to the intense heat and the specific conditions of the desert that stretches across northern Chile and Peru from the extensive Andes mountain range, during late December and early January, strange creatures descend to the villages to deposit their eggs on the roofs of small houses. However, with a dramatic increase in temperatures. Desert dwellers have not only had to deal with an annoying problem of infestation by strange insects, but also with creatures that proliferated due to excessive heat, taking on new and larger forms. The locals call these insectoid creatures Donguius, which take on different types of forms. While they are not particularly dangerous in appearance, on Christmas Eve, all adults lock the children indoors and go out to capture and get rid of all these entities. Their appearance is quite varied, and in terms of height, they seem to vary as well, from the size of a child to even over two meters. The few photographs taken have been incredible evidence of these creatures that, despite their horrendous appearance, have never attacked anyone, and unfortunately, have suffered the consequences of the anger of the inhabitants of the Andean desert cities. While the inhabitants of the Chilean Peruvian desert had no idea where these creatures came from, they saw it as a necessity to go after them to prevent them from continuing to reproduce in the midst of these villages. The precedent for this action took place in the now extinct town of Telesuno, on the border of both countries, in 2009. We've been living with these critters our whole lives. You go to the caves up in the mountains, and you always run into them. These bugs are harmless, buddy. Down there, they just beat them with sticks and don't understand the importance of these beautiful creatures we have in the mountains. We hope one day to become like them and be one with nature. We hope the chrysalis takes all of us, and that way we'll live in nature as it has always been. It was late December, and the townspeople fell victim to an unusual infestation of insects, something common for the season. But this time, after a shocking heat wave, the offspring left on roofs began to grow disproportionately in less than a week. Those pupae hanging from roofs, walls, and even trees alerted the entire population, who in a futile attempt tried to exterminate them. Unfortunately, it was already too late. Due to their weight, they brought down a considerable number of homes. And the use of industrial pesticides was so extensive that families had no choice but to abandon the town, with a clear warning not to allow these strange creatures to infest their homes any further. Over time, various environmental organizations, government agencies, and independent scientists became interested in the phenomenon. So they decided to plan exploratory trips to the depths of the mountain range. Together with high mountain military specialists and local residents familiar with the area, they ventured into the rocky terrain. These missions lasted several months due to low investment and the little interest that the case was generating over time. The expedition resulted in finding several entrances to caves where extensive passages were discovered, posing a significant danger to anyone. In 
Inside they found a few unknown animal species, and quite peculiar biome is hidden among the gigantic mountains. However, the most striking discovery was the existence of larvae pupae, similar to those that had wiped out the town of Telashuno, some showing signs of their own luminescence and varying sizes. Due to a lack of funding, these creatures could not be properly studied, and to this day, no serious attempt has been made to search for them. Once again, in December, they will reappear in the desert locations of Chile and Peru, causing headaches for families that, for many more years, may not have the opportunity to have peaceful year-end celebrations. We need perfect creatures to live. They provide us with food, security, everything that we are unable to produce. Someday, this mountain will erupt, and the world will see what we're made of. We'll implant ourselves all over the land and return to our original form. That's how it will be, and that's how we'll strive to bring it about in the best way possible, all in due time.